everyone. Good evening. It's great to uh, it's great to be with the Rise Up community, and I'm looking forward to a nice conversation. Um, Mahmoud and I were chatting before the the webinar started, and I really wanted to turn this into a conversation with you rather than um, me just sharing ideas. I think it'll be much more interesting if if we can all hear from one another, and and Mahmoud and I can facilitate. So. I wanted to start out by asking a few questions and, um, and and also just you know letting you know who we are. So again, I'm Jeff Abbott with Global Scaling Academy. Uh, we were founded in in Palo Alto, and my partner Chris Ye, I think he was already on a webinar. Is that right, Mahmoud? Earlier? Yeah, yeah. Hey, we kicked off the the series with Chris Ye actually. Exactly. So so Chris is my business partner, and he's the author of of Blitz Scaling, and we work together in support of scaling companies, startup founders, and, and corporate entrepreneurs um, really around the world. Um, we're about to launch a, a new online community coming up in, in about three weeks, which is something we've had in the works, but it's our also accelerated response to the COVID-19 situation. So it, it's, uh, it's one of the ways that, that we're responding is by putting almost everything we do online. Uh, a goal that we had all along, but we're we're moving it up. And during this conversation, I really want to hear from you. What what are you doing to to change your business um, and and address the situation that we all now face? Um, so here's my first question. And it, to to be able to participate, um, please go on your whether it's mobile device, Android or iPhone, or your desktop computer, your Mac. Go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com and type in the code 58021 that you can see on your screen. And this will allow you to participate in the conversation um, and give us a sense of who's on the line tonight. It's 100% anonymous. We will never know who is sharing what response, um, but it will really allow us uh, to get a sense of who's out there and, and the kind of attitudes and, and situations that you're encountering in the world. Um, this, uh, you know, this time has been, has been uh, really challenging for startups. And, and, and I see articles in, in newspapers all around the world about the, um, the impact that, that the COVID-19 is having on startups, uh, whether those be in, uh, in your country, my country, or, or another country, it's a particularly hard time. And so I understand that most of the community here um, in the Rise Up community is, uh, is startup founders, but I really just wanna, I wanna hear that that's the case. So I'm gonna, gonna give you a little time to get to menti.com and, and use the code 58021 to come on in. If you haven't used this tool before, it's actually really cool. And you know how I found it was, I was in Stockholm, Sweden about a year ago, and it turns out this is founded by, by some guys up there. So this is a, uh, this is a startup from, from Stockholm. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to be supporting them. Cool. Well, as people come along, we'll, we'll continue to move forward here, but it, it seems like we've got a good number of startup founders here. And I'm curious. So my understanding is that most of the community tonight is, is joining us from Egypt, but I'm interested to hear where you're from if you're on the webinar tonight. And, and so in this question, you can just type in your answer and, and we'll start to see the answers appear on the screen of where our, our different uh, participants are from. Cool, wow. Brazil, Egypt. Let's see who else might be out there. Djibouti. Uh, we have a very international group, Turkey. I'm actually in Copenhagen, Denmark tonight. So greetings to you from there. We're global, don't doing... worry. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, yeah. So let's keep, uh, and Tunisia, okay. So someone has responded in the Q&A from Tunisia, may not be able to, uh, to access the menti.com tool. Well, anyway, great, this is, uh, this is cool. So I'm going to keep uh, keep moving along here. And this is another 
place for you to type in a short response. And, and the first question is, how has the coronavirus situation affected your business? This is really gonna help us dial in on, on you, which is I think the point of the conversation tonight is not so much to listen to me talk the whole time, but to try to understand what's going on in your world and see if we can find ways um, to help you find solutions. Declining digital sales and a launch of new products that was prevented. It turned your business into a 100% online business. Interesting. So let's take the opportunity to talk about some of these things here um, in real time. We've reoriented our strategy towards focusing on digital products. So again, um, we're, we're live here in the Q&A or uh, someone else writes back, uh, Nabil, that we were stopped in the idea phase. So it kind of it kind of stopped you in your tracks there uh, where you were. So let's talk about this. So I'm, I'm, so if you had declining digital sales and it prevented the launch of new products, is that because the products were, were not gonna be digital and it was impossible to launch the new products? Um, another writes, very much affected us as we offer green office solutions, okay. And, and people aren't going to offices right now. Another response, it converted it to 100% online. I'm curious to know, um, in this case, um, what was the business and, and how hard was it to move it online? What could we learn from you? And another person writes, we've reoriented and now we're focusing on digital products. That seems a, a quite a common uh, adaptation. Someone writes, very much affected us as we're doing uh, high-end giveaways. I see. All right, so they were physical products, so postponing the launch only made sense. You know, so it's interesting. Um, I was reading an article today in, um, in, in Harvard Business Review, and it was talking about, uh, and I can, I can share the link later if anyone's interested, but you know, essentially there, there were a number of points that um, one of them that really stood out was that this is a, a really a great opportunity. Um, a great opportunity to build better relationships um, between you and your employees or, or your network um, because this is something that in the best of cases is bringing people together um, in, a, in a shared problem and, and people, the best in, in people's nature is coming out as people try to help one another. Um, and another is, um, you know, to not expect this to be the, the last time that this happens that there probably are gonna be lasting consequences of this or not just um, a recurrence of the, of the virus itself, but um, many, many economic uh, readjustments that, that will be coming from this. Um, so it's good to see these responses and, and how quickly many of you are, are moving forward. So I'm curious to know, um, now in our case, I'm, I'm in Copenhagen for a period of time and, and our business is really quite, quite remote anyway. We're, we're a fairly small team um, and not all of us live in the same location. Um, our partner company in, in Copenhagen, which is called Valuer, um, we all work out of an office, but because it's a, a digital business, everyone has gone home and, and we've remained connected you know, using email, Slack, and Zoom. Um, but I think, you know, opinions vary about whether working remotely has made it, um, you know, easier to get our work done. Um, it's, you can't just walk around the corner anymore and say hello to people or call a quick meeting. Um, some people have said, yeah, you know, nobody wants to talk about our business right now, so it's not a good time to you know, to try to contact a, a new prospect and, and probably their budgets are completely frozen. Whereas others have, have suggested that it's probably the best time because companies' businesses may be disrupted and, and almost everyone's working from home. And so chances are people's routine is a little broken and it might be actually easier to 
pick up the phone and call someone or send an email and kind of break through the noise. Um, on the subject of staying focused and staying productive, um, working from home is an adjustment for some people, but many people already work from home and, and already have pretty, uh, pretty productive routines. So, um, you know, I'm curious to know, um, maybe uh, in, in a response in the, in the chat, how many of you were already working from home? Um, is, this, uh, is this something that uh, really was a change for you or um, or was it just uh, an opportunity to move everything online? Yeah, so, you know, um, harder to scale seems to be the, the main concern. And of course, that's the topic of the webinar tonight. But, um, but it's definitely interesting to see here that nobody here is expressing it, that they're having a hard time staying in touch with colleagues and getting their work done. Um, most people seem to find it, you know, not any harder to get in touch with prospects and customers. So the challenge is staying productive and focusing and continuing to scale. Um, I want to delve a little bit deeper into those. Yeah, okay, so different people here. Salma writes that they transitioned to working from home in mid-March, but previously had regular office hours. And another guest writes, we worked from a home office once a week, but we had regular hours that we needed to be in the office. So it's not so much that working remotely is something that we've never done before. Probably most people have that capability. Um, it's maybe just the adjustment that everyone is facing in every organization being forced to do that so quickly. So my next question is, if you answered that it was harder to connect with prospects and customers, why do you think that is? Now, the answer on that question was about a 2.7. So most people didn't think it was that much harder to connect during these times with customers and prospects. So if that wasn't you, just leave us a comment here. How has it changed? Or you could say, what are you doing differently to try to connect? Are, are you doing the same things that you used to do or trying new things? One of the things that I've seen very common, I get a lot of emails and I'm sure you all do too, but one of the things that's been very common is a letter coming out from the CEO of the company, uh, a software company or a marketing company or just about any company announcing what their company is doing to respond to the to the situation um, how they're taking care of their employees or what ways they've made donations to the um, the local relief efforts in their community or it could be you know if they offer a product a service or a software um, how they've reduced prices or made certain features available um, I've been getting a lot of emails like that. The second most common email that I've been getting is um, suggestions about how to work remotely. I must have received a dozen emails with thoughts about best practices for working effectively from home. And so um, there does seem to be a fairly common playbook that people are, are trying to use, um, whether it be you know, emails or, or webinars uh, to stay in the attention of, of their prospect and customers. Um, the response on the screen here, and I'm interested to hear from more of you, is corporates are slashing their budgets. Yeah, um, they're sending people home. Um, you know, their supply chains are disrupted. So if you're a B2B startup, it could be a difficult time for them to commit to a new, a new contract. Um, what can you do with the existing contracts that you have. I'm curious to know what kind of conversations have you had? Have you called all of your customers? Have you spoken to them about the situation that they're facing and asked questions about, you know, what kind of changes do they see coming and how does this change their role, their priorities? Um, I'm curious to know 
and you can type your responses here. What, what have each of you done personally? How, how have you reached out and, and, and tried to communicate or tried to understand um, what's different? Nabil writes, I've been using social platforms to connect with customers. It's an interesting time to, you know, to, to try to establish a connection um, and maybe, maybe, you know, be, be concerned, be helpful, um, offer to go the extra mile and, and, and do something that you might not have, you might not have done before. Um, to stay in people's good graces. If you answered that it was harder to stay focused and productive, what solutions have you found? Um, as I mentioned, I'm actually pretty used to working remotely. I've uh, been working internationally and remotely for a number of years. And um, so being, being alone or working from home isn't what bothers me um, at all. But some of the things that I do, um, for example, is I, I try to have um, a daily practice. Um, definitely, um, you know, to do some yoga. Um, I haven't been out of the house in, in a month, probably like, like most of you, um, except to go to the grocery store or to walk, you know, a couple blocks down to the corner with my dog to go to the park. Here in Denmark, we're, we're able to go out of the house, but I know in many places, like, um, you know, like in some places in Italy or um, in, in other places, if you leave the house, you're actually fined or, or you can risk, you know, some kind of criminal. Um, so having a, a routine, um, someone writes, getting up every morning, getting dressed, setting a routine, um, listening uh, to video and audio. Uh, yeah, motivating the team. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that I think is, you know, is even more important now. And I notice, you know, in our team, and we've got, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 75 people checking in daily on a Slack channel. It seems like it's more important to communicate a little bit more now. Um, at least that's my observation. And, and just kind of let, you know, let people know that somebody's thinking about them, maybe put a little more um, frequent general update, kind of, conversation and into the Slack channel, into the emails to kind of over communicate right now because maybe you don't have that opportunity to see your colleagues in the office and say hello and just those small details of a, you know, looking at someone or a smile. The other thing is I listened to a, uh, I listened to a podcast that was actually from the Masters of Scale series by Reed Hoffman, if any of you have heard that and it's one of the ones where he interviews a, a gentleman from from Chile who's called Wences Cáceres and Wences has started a company that is 100% remote there's no office and he has about 275 employees and none of them are where he is and so one of the one of the tips that I found in this podcast that I think could be interesting for you is he um he, he uses two devices on Zoom and what he does is he keeps open office hours. I thought that was cool. So he said, you know, if I was in a physical office, I'm the kind of guy that would always leave my door open. I, I would want anybody in the company to be able to come and feel they could approach me, they could talk to me and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Um, and so the way that he keeps that um, feeling of closeness and being accessible is to have one device like you know an iPad or, or an iPhone where he's got a Zoom personal meeting room going on all the time. And, and he lets people know, um, including customers, hey, if you need to talk to me, just drop into my Zoom room anytime. And of course, you know, if he has to do a private meeting, well, then he opens up another Zoom instance and gets that meeting going and he maybe just mutes the, um, you know, the, the open personal meeting room. And if people pop their head in the door, you know, look in, they can see that he's busy and they just come back later. Uh, but I thought that was really cool, really practical. I read this about three days ago. And, and so I started doing that, uh, doing that myself. If you said that it was harder to scale during coronavirus, 
Um, why is that and what are you doing differently? So this one is the one that got the highest answers and I did already hear um, some of your answers before, but um, if you wouldn't mind re retyping them here, but um, in this case, focus a little bit more on sharing with Mahmoud and myself, what are you doing differently? Like I know that, that the budgets have been slashed in some of your customers. I know if you had a physical product or you were providing services in an office, um, that is, uh, you know, clearly challenging. But I'm interested to hear what kind of creative, entrepreneurial, very fast responses have you tried to develop and to experiment with and to test. This is actually the time that uh, that probably brings out the best in, in experimentation um, because everybody's going through it together. Really curious here to hear um, some of the things that, that you've discovered, particularly as it relates to scaling. So one of the things that, you know, that I think um, is so obvious that, that's happening now is, you know, people always talk about it's a global world, it's a global economy, we're all connected, um, you know, and I think the internet makes it feel that way, but the reality is most people don't think global. Most people have a, a fairly local community. Um, even if you're scaling your business, you're probably scaling locally. You're probably in one market or, or, or maybe two. Um, but one of the things that this really reinforces is the opportunity to truly think global. Like what, what if the only way that you could meet people and the only opportunity ever, what if, what if the entire outside world was suddenly toxic or we were struck by an asteroid and, and that was the only way to work? I can guarantee you, you'd be thinking differently and doing different things. And some people would figure it out. Um, and, and it's almost that extreme scenario that thinking through that is, uh, is, really, is really necessary. So here, budget constraints have made it harder to hire and grow the team that we needed to scale at the moment. There's a lot of uncertainty and trepidation. I understand. And so question in this case, and, and you can type multiple responses, I believe, in, in these pages. Um, what, 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 was, what was it that you were hiring the team to do? And how much of that um, depended on, on hiring them? Are there other ways to get that work done? Declining digital sales and closure of sales rooms for physical products. We've been looking at TikTok as a source of organic reach and finding new offerings to fit new demographics. Trying to do business after coronavirus and to adapt to new customer needs. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about this. So if your business is, is declining in budgets, budget, then, then I guess the big question here is, can you continue to scale? Or is that even a realistic expectation right now? Or is a realistic expectation to retrench, to, to strengthen, to re-examine? to become more efficient, more resilient, more solid. Um, I think it's pretty clear that, um, you know, in an environment of 20% decline in uh, the, the numbers coming out of the Chinese economy are, you know, 20% decline. Um, in the United States, 16 million people filing for unemployment in just the last two weeks. Um, I don't even think scaling at this time um, at least the way you were doing it before is, is, is even a realistic expectation. Um, so the question is, how do you hold on? How do you survive? How do you become more resilient and start planning for the rebound, right? And figure out what you're really good at. What's the, the core strength of your organization? This is going to end. It is going to end. And the question is, how are you gonna survive? How are you gonna last? 
how are you going to get better at the things that you're really good at, the things that continue to be useful, the aspects of this new way of working that where you can develop an advantage so that you become more resilient, more competitive, and more prepared to rebound once this is over. An example, I was reading an article, I think it was in Fortune, it could have been in the Wall Street Journal last week, and it was a, an interview with David Cody, and David Cody was the CEO of Honeywell until about three years ago. He also used to be the CEO at the company, the last big corporation that I worked at, General Electric Appliances, so he's someone that I, that I actually worked for um, and, and, and knew for couple of years and he was a brilliant manager um, and he was describing what he did during the last crisis the financial crisis of 2008 and how the decisions that he made during the last crisis allowed Honeywell to rebound to come back stronger than ever while many companies had to lay people off and many people uh, you know, many, many of these companies suffered and, and never really recovered. And there were some really great lessons in this article. The first was, he didn't lay people off. He just, he furloughed them. He sent them home um, with some commitment that their job would still be there, but with reduced pay. Number two, while all of his competitors were canceling orders with, with suppliers. He went out and talked to all of his suppliers, the people that he was going to meet again in a couple months or in a couple years when things went back to normal, because they were all hurting too. His suppliers were hurting just as bad as his company. And he talked to them and said, listen, if, if I can hold on to some kind of a minimum commitment to you right now, is there some way that you can give me priority?" when things come back? Can you make sure that I'm first in line? Can you make sure that I get better prices, that my supply um, won't be limited? Is there some way that you could take, take that same strategy when you're talking to your customers and say, you know, here's what I can do with you. I know that you're probably um, reducing costs. I know that our relationship may be in danger, but um, here's what I can do for you if, if you stick with me during these times. And so it's, it's not only adapting to working remotely and adapting, you know, to more digital ways of working, uh, with the products themselves, I mean, so not only the way we work, but the nature of the products and services, because this situation is going to end. It's, and it's going to rebound. And, and so the question is, what, what are you doing now? What conversations are you having with your employees, with your suppliers, with your customers to let them know that you understand this is going to end and to kind of make a deal? What deal can you make to survive and get through with an improved way of working, but also with some advantage that came out of this? Um, oh, you can't enter a second response. That sucks. I'm sorry. I must have set it up the wrong way. I'm very sorry, Salma. Um, Salma writes in the chat, we've been trying to reallocate underutilized team members towards functions or departments that need extra help these days, but there are still some technical skill sets needed that we don't have within the current team. You know, so some thoughts here, and I, I, I don't know what networks you need to tap, uh, or but you know, right now, um, there, are, there are plenty of people out there, uh, I'm sure, who would like to have a relationship with your company. Um, for example, um, you know, I had posted for a number of, of jobs and uh, some, some full-time jobs and some internships just before this happened. And, and I found that um, people in the job market, of course, are, you know, they're also facing uncertainty and not knowing what's going to happen coming out of this. And so people, people are also willing to be very flexible and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sitting at home. Um, you know, even though I'm busy, I don't know what's happening. I, I may be willing to spend some time in order to, 
create a new option for myself. I'd, I'd be willing to build a new relationship with, with another company to, to create options for myself. And, and so um, keep looking for that technical skill set out there because I think, I think there are a lot of people that, you know, that, that are looking for new options and, um, and, and of course, they want to develop um, the ability to work remotely, they, even if they have a job. Um, I think this has given everyone um, a reason to really think about what do I do? How do I do it? How resilient am I? How much do I depend on, on a job? Am I, you know, completely at risk? How have you tried to reach your prospects? What new offers have you made to support your customers to try to keep scaling? This is kind of where I was going with that last question based on the interview with the article, uh, the article with the interview with the CEO of Honeywell. And although Honeywell is a, a multi-billion dollar corporation, um, the advice of, of David Cody, the CEO, was incredibly practical and, and, and applies to a business of any size. And it basically was to be counterintuitive, to be counter cyclical, to try to think how do I do something that's a little different than what everybody's doing now and a little bit unexpected? Everyone's going to lay people off now. Everybody's going to cut budgets now. Everybody's going to follow the herd. How can I do something a little different? How can I, you know, really cut all unnecessary expenses? Everything, like he was talking about you know, janitorial supplies and water, like literally every possible thing that you spend money on to give yourself the flexibility um, to make some bets, uh, to make some deals, either with employees, with new talent or with customers. I'm curious to know, how have you come up with new ways of, of, of offering what you do? One, one example that really inspired me, and I think it's inspired a lot of people, is the initiative called Hack the Crisis that started about three weeks ago in Estonia. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it. And what happened was they have a community of people. They're all connected on Slack. There's a government minister that put out a question, hey, what can we do to find solutions to the crisis here in Estonia? And this went out on Slack and a, and a conversation started and somebody said, well, why don't we do a hackathon? We do hackathons all the time. Why don't we do a hackathon for this? And in about 15 minutes, the, the, the government minister and the people on the Slack channel said, yeah, let's do it. And 30 minutes later, they were on a phone call planning it all out and they took their offline digital hackathon and moved it online. And they did it all with Zoom and with Slack, following the same exact structure that they did um, a normal hackathon over the weekend. And within three weeks, this has now spread to over 50 countries. And now they're running a hackathon a virtual hackathon where they're trying to get 1 million people participating around the world. All of this happened in three weeks. And when I spoke to several of the people that ran it, I, I called them, I, I knew a couple of them, and I said, this is incredible. I wanna know, how did you do this? What was the secret? And they said, well, you know, the only, the only way this worked was because we, we already had a community. People were already connected. We knew who to reach out to, and, and we already sort of had a way of working. So the answer that I took away was how important it is to have an active community. Um, having an active community takes making an effort. Um, even if you don't live someplace where you have an active community um, or you think you don't, you can build one, you can find one, you can become a part of one. Um, if you have that intention. And, and right now is a time when having a community, having a, a network of, of people that you can call on to brainstorm with, to um, 
offer suggestions or to pitch in and help you with a new initiative is, is kind of priceless. So certainly one of the things I'm taking away at this time is I definitely need to spend more time maintaining and cultivating my network and, and my community. Finding ways to do that virtually. Um, what new skills or new ways of work have your team developed? Is there something that you weren't doing before that you discovered that you've gotten better at that becomes um, part of the, uh, the new way going forward? So that's the end of my um, of my presentation, um, my dialogue, and I want to turn it back over to to all of you um, and to Mahmoud um, to see if um, if there are specific things that you want to discuss that maybe I can that I can speak to. But it's been important to me to to kind of understand who's out there to hear about your challenges um, specifically, so that. If you do ask me questions, I'm not just um, making things up. So thank you very much for, for participating and in, in using menti.com and hopefully that was a, a, useful, uh, a useful experience. Um, thank yeah, you so much Jeff, for that presentation. Interesting. Uh, I love the comment here. Look at this. We, we've actually become better communicators because everyone's trying to be as clear and efficient as possible. I'm, I'm finding that too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's somehow there's a silver lining in this, right? We're, we're getting, we're, we're getting more independent. We're getting more connected. We're realizing how important the team is. It's a, it's important. Sorry, I interrupted you, Mahmoud. I'm, I'm finished with my comments. You're done, right? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you so much. I really like the presentation and I really like Menti. It's a Swedish startup? Yeah, it's from it's from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, I think it's yeah. a couple of years old. I, I don't know how far along they are, but I've been using it for about a year and every time I used it, people say, wow, that's so great. And then the next time I talk to them, they're using it too. Yeah, it's super cool. It's really, it's really, really, really cool. Uh, so we're gonna start with the, with the Q&A right now, okay? Yeah. So this is a call out for the audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask any question to Jeff, I'll be moderating right now. Uh, so the first question says, uh, with companies with physical products and declining sales, Scaling does not make sense at the moment. Does not make sense at the moment. What would you recommend? Uh, finding a digital offering or right through the storm? Well, I think that, you know, going back to the comments that I was making uh, based on the article with the CEO of Honeywell, which I, I thought was incredible. There's another one right now uh, written by Boston Consulting Group in Harvard Business Review, um, you know, that right now is really a time to focus on re-examining um, everything about what you do and how you do it, digging really, really deep and coming at it with the assumption that this is not the only time that this is going to happen, that, that, you know, things are not going to go back to normal. They, they may get better, but it's not going to be the normal it was before. And, and so, um, this is absolutely the time to focus on, you know, strengthening on resilience um, and how to rebound, how to how to come out of this. And so, um, if if that means being counterintuitive and not doing what everyone else is doing, um, not following the herd. So, you know, if it's if it's not possible to scale right now, then live to scale another day. Don't be one of the startups that that. Um, you know, isn't able to survive this, um, find a way even, you know, I, I don't know what that, what that way necessarily is, but, um, 
but try to survive. Yeah, sure. Um, another question, are there any personal habits you've cultivated to maintaining motivation among your team uh, when you work from home starts to become draining or some sort of difficult? Personal habits. Um, well, a couple of the things that I mentioned, um, you know, I try to post things into the Slack channel that are just general kind of announcements just to um, let people know we're still there and, and kind of, I'm, I'm always thinking, um, trying to recreate the, the moments that would be there at the office, even though, you know, I'm not able to walk through there, you know, I, I often make a joke or stop in, you know, the room, you know, the one of the departments and, and say hello to people or make fun of people or, or whatever. So try to find a way to keep that um, interpersonal dialogue going, because sometimes it's very, it's very well known that communicating only through chat or email, it always, the, the language always seems a little harder, right? Like when, when you say, when you say something to someone in person and they can see your face and hear your voice, it's always a much softer message where if you just write something in Slack or an email, um, it can often be unemotional. And, and so we, we definitely have to find ways to keep the, the human touch. Um, as far as motivating, um, yeah, I think it, it certainly becomes more important to track projects online. If, if you weren't already using tools like Asana or Trello or Google Doc, uh, you know, project tracking, um, it's, it seems more important than ever to, to, to develop those skills. Um, you know, and thirdly for me, I just, I have to keep some form of uh, personal, personal fitness, uh, you know, discipline routine at home. Uh, to keep myself motivated, to keep myself healthy and, uh, and, and in a good place. Yeah, that, that, that workout thing is really crucial. I've, yeah. spend, I've been spending like 60 days on my chair just working. So, yeah. Yeah. so workout is really crucial. Oh. Yeah. I know. My body hurts from sitting in the chair so much now, but, but you got to yeah. do something you got about it. What, what do you do, Mahmoud? Um, I just try, I try to work out as, as at least even if like 20 or 30 minutes per day as yeah. much as I can I try to find the time to uh, to do so I have we have like so much uh, work to do right now in Raisa because we're pushing so much mm -hmm. digital content mm -hmm. but I try to make the time to at least jog or do a few jumps or a few push-ups or whatsoever great idea yeah um, we have a question on um, from Facebook um, hello, Jeff. Kindly, uh, how to build a community during quarantine, especially in a candle making? In candle making, I need some ideas. In candle making? Uh, yeah. Like yeah. wax candles that burn is the word candle? It's the business. Yeah, yeah exactly. Candles, yeah. Ah, perfect. Well, you know, and I don't know if you're, if you're already doing this already, but, um, you know, creating, uh, creating videos, hosting, hosting webinars seems to be uh, one of the most important ways to, you know, to build community. Um, I've been reading a lot about community lately. I actually bought several books and I've, I've been speaking to people that I know have, have a lot of experience at, at building communities. Um, and, and there's three pieces of advice that I, that I got from them that, that I'm putting into the, the new community that Chris Ye and I are building right now, the one that we'll launch in a few weeks. And the first one is, um, you know, when, when you create a community, it's, it's got to be really clear who it's for. Um, and what is it that they um, should expect to get out of it? What is the journey that you're taking them on? Um, why should they come to your community, in other words? And number two, um, is everyone that joins should be welcomed. And, and so when, when you create a community, you have to sort of be the model of the behavior that that you want people in the community to follow. So if you're the first one in the community, it's your community and someone joins, you have to welcome them and um, be responsive to them and, and seek to understand what, what they want, right? And hopefully then when the third person joins, the second person will join you in welcoming them and, and modeling the same behavior. And so some of that is, um, just being a nice person. And some of that is, is actually having a really clear, almost like checklist of things that you do. 
Um, because of course, when the second person joins, that's easy, but when it's the 200 and second person, now you almost need a process. So that gets me to the third point is, you know, if you know who the community is for and you can get people into it, you really need to have an onboarding process. What are the things that you want the people who join your community to do on the first day that they join? What about on the third day or on the seventh or 14th or the 30th day? Do you have a plan? Have you created a calendar for yourself about what's going to happen in your community? So let's say you're in the candle business and I believe you said you're, you're making candles and, and maybe the business is teaching people how to make candles um, or at least showing them how you make candles so that they prefer your candles and, and are willing to pay more for them than someone else's candles. Um, you almost need to have an agenda. You need to have a calendar of events. Like um, maybe there's some short videos that you can put up or articles that you can post. Um, where are you going to create this community? Are you going to, are you going to build a community on a website? Are you going to do it on Facebook live? But however you do it, people have to know what to expect, know what's coming. And you got to have a way to bring them back and remind them. So there's a degree of thinking and process and, you know, almost marketing automation that, that, that could work here. So, um, I hope that's helpful, but th those are the things that I've taken away from conversations and, and books that I've read um, that we're really spending a lot of time on up, up front. We're going to launch this community in three weeks, and hopefully a lot of these um, pieces of advice will be will be installed into it. Okay. Um, another question Ali is asking, should companies go out of their way to find ways to sell, or would it dilute their current products? go out of the way to try to find ways to sell, like, I mean, cut prices, deep discounts, like do anything, uh, be desperate or, um, you know, um, it's kind of hard to know exactly what was, what was meant there. But, um, but I think um, there's, there's two sides of the, of the story here, right? Many people that we talk to, the answer we get back is, you know, they just really can't think about anything else right now. You know, they're, they're not able to, to think very far ahead or they're not able to buy something or make a commitment right now. Um, and that seems to be a really, a really, really common answer. So going, going back to some of my, you know, previous comments, if it's a current customer and you're worried that they might cut your service or discontinue working with you, then definitely be proactive and speak to them and, and say, you know, how have things changed and how has the priority of the service or product that I'm providing to you, how has that become more or less important? And, you know, how can I work with you to support you during this time? Even if we have to change the terms of our relationship, um, you know, I'm very willing to be flexible, but I want to keep the relationship. Um, Similarly, you know, when you're talking to new customers or I mean prospects that aren't your customer yet, they, they may also have a, um, you know, glasses half empty approach to this saying, we couldn't possibly take on a new product or service now, but this is where you have to encourage them to, to see this will end. How are you preparing for, for life on the other side? You know, when this ends, you know, are you going to be able to restart your business? Is, is the stuff I'm providing to you right now going to be even more important than it was before? Um, you know, it's important, it's important to keep this relationship because you're going to need me on the other side. So how can we work that out? You know, maybe, maybe if you knew that they were going to resume the contract in, in 30 days or 60 days, or they could commit to it in the future, you know, maybe, maybe there's ways you, you can hold on, you know, but I think it comes down to conversation. It comes down to, um, you know, in the article uh, with the Honeywell CEO, he said he had all the salespeople and all the purchasing people on the phone 
you know, talking to everyone, really, really trying to understand what was going on in their businesses so that they had the intelligence of knowing how to position themselves to come out of it stronger than everybody else. So you gotta, you gotta think about everybody else is going through this too. Everybody doing what you do, all of your competitors. Your goal should be to come out stronger than them. Whether that's stronger than you were three weeks ago, I don't know. But if you can come out of this better position than everyone else, then when things kick back in, they, they might kick back in really hard. Are you gonna be in a position to deliver? Okay. Um, another question. Do you think offering free services to wider consumer base for a month or two, hoping they will join is a solid strategy or should we test and let the market decide? I think you should definitely test it. Absolutely. I think okay. everybody's, you know, everybody's looking for, for new solutions right now and, and, and particularly customers that haven't, tried your services before, um, they, they may be looking for, for new solutions and new ways of responding to the crisis. If, if they can get a taste, um, even a limited taste of what you do, and, and they learn something that you could be a part of the solution, uh, they didn't know that before because they never gave you a try, um, then that could be a new opportunity. So I, I definitely think this is the time to find ways to um, you know, I don't, whether it's a free trial or a limited engagement or even something pro bono, um, if, if, if you show a genuine focus on helping them, you know, solve a problem that they're facing and helping them survive and, and become more resilient, um, you know, as, as long as you can manage that resource commitment, then, then you're bound to learn something and, and likely generate new opportunities. Okay. Uh, one final question. Um, the reports estimating that 30% of all SMBs in China are closing. So do you have any predictions for, uh, for the US? Things are pretty hard in the US right now. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is definitely going to happen, um, um, I don't, I, I, I do not know what, what actions the Chinese government has taken um, to support small businesses. Um, I, I am familiar with what's being done in, in the United States and in some countries, you know, in, in Europe. Um, I've heard a few stories, uh, read a few stories uh, of what's going on in, in other parts of the world as well. Um, but I think, you know, the response is, has been very different in, in many places. So I don't know if there's, if there's support coming from the government to keep the small and medium businesses alive in China. Um, many of those are, are online businesses. You know, for example, uh, I, I know many Amazon sellers, uh, you know, the, the Chinese depend very heavily on, on the United States consumer market. Yeah, sure. And, and so if, you know, if, if the U.S. consumer isn't buying, then, um, then the Chinese economy will, will be suffering as well. Right. The Chinese, the Chinese economy has already been hit really, really hard. I haven't, I haven't seen, I think because it started earlier there, the figures are already out, but the last article I read showed that many of the economic measures were, you know, four times as, as, as bad of an impact than anyone had expected in a number of different areas. Like, so, um, regarding the questions of local sourcing, um, I, I think it's inevitable um, that many, many countries are going to be re-examining their supply chain and keeping a focus more on, you know, on sovereignty and, and risk prevention. Um, I have heard this, um, I've heard comments from the president of France. Um, yesterday, the, the Japanese uh, government announced that part of their economic stimulus was going to Japanese country companies to help them move production out of China back to Japan or to other countries um, in order to reduce dependence on, on China. Um, and so I definitely think um, many, many countries are going to be looking at um, 
you know, the fact that they, they need to have more control over the basic needs of their population. Uh, it's not just the, you know, um, one country or two countries, but every country that's been affected by this is going to say, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And probably the people that get hit the hardest by that are going to be the Chinese because so much of manufacturing of everything has been outsourced to China. Um, but I believe there's a very there's a very important factor that we should look at right now right here is um, the price thing. Actually, people outsource to China because China is super super cheap when it comes to producing in any other country. Uh, so, what do you think of that? Will people go for producing in their local countries and accept the fact that it's it might be a little bit expensive, or will they will be actually still depending on China and Vietnam on all these other countries? I think it depends on the country. I think I think in many cases, you know, it'll go back to to where it was before. And um, I think some countries that, um, you know, consider it very strategic will will be willing to pay, you know, an extra price and and um, you know and and pay extra to bring certain capabilities back home. Uh, I think it, it it's just going to be a national decision, you know, about. Yeah. How, how vulnerable and, and probably it's it's in proportion to um, you know how, how bad were they hit I, I, I certainly think in the case of the United States which has been hit very hard by this that that, yeah. that is one place where a, a lot of changes will be made but I, I'm not certain you know um, like in Brazil we have a, a participant here from Brazil been reading about what's going on in Brazil and um, it, it sounds like uh, you know, um, it's one of the places where the, the government has, you know, like in Sweden, um, they have they have chosen not to really take many measures. And, um, you know, in, in Brazil, the people want more stricter measures, but the government has been saying, you know, sort of everything is okay. So I think it's too early to say, right? We have, I mean, when, when the dust settles, we'll have to see who was right, no, who was wrong. wrong. How, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, we're done. We have no more questions right now. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for the for the presentation. It was really nice talking to you uh, today, and the presentation was really awesome. And Menti was very awesome as well. So thank you so much. Well, I'm really glad. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you guys tonight, Mahmoud, and and with the Rise Up community. And if anybody wants to stay in touch, that's my uh, my email on the screen. Um, and uh, we hope to see you in Cairo really soon. I'd really like that. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's something I I, I want to do. And so let's let's everybody get through this and stay safe. Take care of your uh, your families and your friends and your loved ones and uh, be well. And and hopefully uh, we'll be in touch again somewhere soon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, soon. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Thanks to everyone who tuned in right now. Thank you so much. And uh, you gotta expect we have something very cool next Sunday. So uh, make sure you follow our page to uh, to see what that is. Uh, and thank you all, and have a good day. Bye, Jeff. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.